So we're going to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship this morning and talk about how we got to where we are. So the title is How Entrepreneurs Built the World. Of course, just like that last time, if you haven't already, follow me on Twitter. Okay? That's an order. Um, everything else is voluntary, but that's not. Okay, so what is it that the entrepreneurs built? Well, here are a couple of pictures that I wanted to show you that show the difference um, in the world. So on the left, you have Shanghai, with only 20 years of difference going from not much at all to something that looks um, futuristic. And on the left, you have Dubai, going from basically a desert to a modern city. Of course, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship and the market. And you might think that, well, communist China, Dubai might not be super free markets. And that's correct. But I wanted to showcase what is possible by simply doing production and using resources in the right way. Right? So I'll limit this discussion a little bit, not talking about communism and how communism is great and how communism creates a lot, because it doesn't. Um, through the state, we don't actually get anything new. They don't create value. They only reallocate value at best. Uh, if it's really successful, we get to plus minus zero. Entrepreneurship is about creating value and creating opportunities for us all. So I'll leave that uh, discussion about planning investments, uh, state investments, and regulations to a, a separate discussion that we can have later on if you wish. Uh, and I've also written a book on this showing the difference between the market process itself as an entrepreneurially driven process of creation and then adding regulations to it to see what are the actual true costs of regulations. If you uh, Google, well, my name, I guess, and, and regulations, you're going to find a couple of speeches and things like that where I argue that even libertarians don't really understand how destructive regulations are. And that's what I show in that book. Um, so whenever you think that regulations suck and they um, destroy a lot of value, think again because it's even worse. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Entrepreneurship, we've already talked about it a couple of times and the first, uh, Dr. Klein's first lecture a couple of days ago was on entrepreneurship, what entrepreneurship is and how Mises defines entrepreneurship as simply uncertainty bearing. Well, this type of entrepreneurship is sort of a broad definition that is a part of any action. Right? So the world is changing around us, everybody's taking actions, aiming for some end or that they think is going to be valuable to them, and everybody else is doing the same, so you don't really know whether you're gonna be able to attain your own end, and of course, if you're producing for others, you don't know if anybody's gonna actually value what you're producing. That's a huge problem. Well, we're not talking about all action. That's a little hard to, um, hard to analyze to begin with in specific cases. It's also not all action that creates uh, wealth and creates prosperity. It's something more, much more specific, much more narrowly defined, and we're gonna talk about that specific uh, type of entrepreneurship that creates much more wealth than simply acting. Because believe it or not, even communists act, right? And they do not create wealth, not a whole lot. Uh, sometimes they do for themselves, but that's just stealing from others. Okay, so this narrower case is what Mises refers to as the entrepreneur promoter. And he has sort of a little bit of a vague definition of it, but that doesn't really matter. We're going to focus on what the promoters do and what defects they have in the economy uh, overall. Okay, so... It's not just any action, it's an action that is really disruptive and innovative and creative for the economy overall. Okay, so if you look at what Mises writes about this, he talks about the promoter as the driving force of the market. Now there are plenty of driving forces in human action and they're sort of varied a little bit. Uh, he talks about entrepreneurship as the driving force of the market, he talks about profit as the driving force of the market, and he talks about the promoter as the driving force of the market. Well, I would argue that it's, he really means the promoter in all of these cases. So it's not really different, he's just using different terms to show what he actually means, what the, what the core of this concept is. 
Okay, so the restlessness of the promoter he talks about here, the unceasing uh, innovation and improvement of the economy is the task of the promoter, or rather, whoever causes this stuff is a promoter, okay? Another way he puts this is that the promoters are those who are especially eager to profit from adjusting production to the expected changes in conditions, okay? So they have the quicker eye in the crowd and stuff like that. That doesn't really help us a whole lot, right? But the unceasing innovation and adjusting production, you've already heard of the, about the capital structure and production structure in the many stages, and we'll get back to that, um, and how the economy is so advanced and it's sort of directed towards people's future wants in some way, even though it's not planned, and how could that happen? Okay, well, the promoters are in, engaged in this task of directing the whole production apparatus of the economy to create value for people in the future, which is a difficult task, to say the least. Okay, so if you take Mises, then you have the unceasing innovation and improvement, you have the pioneers of economic improvement. He's also talking about how the main, uh, the main uh, function of the promoter is to make the great adjustments of the economy. So it's not really tinkering in, in the edges. It's not really looking, oh, look at that. It's a little, that, that chewing gum there is a little cheaper there and a little more expensive there, so I'll just buy there and sell there. That sort of arbitrage. That's not really what he has in mind here. He's not talking about just simple trade and, and simple uh, spot market profits or, or being a day trader in the, in the stock market and so forth. He's talking about the great adjustments to production. Well, production, that's a physical thing, right? That's machines, those are factories, those are trucks, those are construction workers, really manly stuff, right? So those great adjustments, shifting production from one thing to a completely different thing is what the, the promoters are involved in. So let's add that to the list. Great adjustments of production. Okay, so what the heck does it, this all mean? Well. It means that the promoter is something that is very different from other concepts of entrepreneurship. We already distinguished it from the entrepreneurship is simply uncertainty bearing in any action. Well, the promoter is also different from correcting errors, as Israel Kirstner would put it. Right? It's not about just reallocating uh, funds or resources from one end to the other shifting back and forth a little bit, tweaking the system, making it a little more effective or efficient. That's not really what we're talking about here. It's not about correcting those in inefficiencies that are already in the economy. It's also not about reallocating uh, resources that are already existing between already existing production structures and production processes. So it's also not Hayek's uh, 1945 article where you see the pricing mechanism, how the, how the pricing mechanism helps entrepreneurs do the right thing and choose the right materials. Uh, Hayek talks about the, pin, the, the tin factory and the production of tin and how there's a, a disaster that limits the output of tin in the world and entrepreneurs don't have to know this. They just have to respond to the higher prices, right? So the entrepreneurship is sort of a responsive agent. When prices change, they go, oh, that's too expensive for me, I'm gonna do something else or I'm going to choose a different material. Well, of course, from a Misesian point of view is, where the heck did the new prices come from, right? The, the big question is not, do people respond to price changes? Duh, yeah, of course they do. But the question is, why did the prices change? And it's not the case that you don't have to know about the disaster in the tin mine, because you can just respond to prices. Someone has to jack up the freaking price to begin with, right? That someone, why did they increase the price? But probably because they knew something about the disaster. Right? Very different uh, story. So looking at the promoter, we disrupt the economy from within. It's not really about disaster, because that's what, where we started out with communism. Right? OK, so how does the promoter accomplish these, these changes and change the economy and direct the, the market process overall? Well, Lachman puts it like this, that everything is changing all the time, right? People's preferences are changing. We discover new resources. We discover new technologies. We attempt new things, 
even though most entrepreneurs uh, fail most of the time. We try in different combinations of capital, even though that sounds like you're playing, you're, you're playing with Lego blocks. Right? The economy is a little more advanced. You're actually creating Lego blocks, rather. Um, and it's talking about how the capital structure of the economy is constantly changing. It's always dissolved and reformed and put in a diff together in a different shape. It's not simply shifting resources from one production process to the next. It's building up new capital structures. This is very different, right? OK, so if that is the true um, function of the entrepreneur, which is the true function of the promoter, making the capital structure change, then how does that happen? Well, we can create, recreate, and direct productive capability through inventing or innovating. Well, which one do you think is of interest to us here? Well, we tend to focus on invention, but invention is completely worthless in a sense. Because invention is just the idea, OK? So this, the standard uh, distinction between invention and innovation is, is you can find that in Schumpeter, but others have, have said the same thing. That the invention is the new idea. And if you take a course in, in entrepreneurship, you will learn basically this first day that the idea does not really matter. It's the implementation that matters. So the iPhone was not the first smartphone. There were plenty of smartphones before then, it's just that they didn't implement the idea in a very good way. They didn't uh, position the idea, position the product in a very good way. So consumers were like, uh, I don't care. Right? The same thing with the tablet. Uh, most of you are probably too young to remember the, the tablet PC, which was basically an iPad, but a much more powerful one based off of Windows XP. So it's a Microsoft innovation. Well, Microsoft, they're, they're awesome at being really bad at marketing. <laughs> so it didn't really sell at all, and it was a complete flop. Well, some 10 years later, Apple innovates the iPad. They didn't invent the iPad because the tablet was already in existence. There were plenty of tablets before the iPad. They innovated the iPad. They completely changed um, people's behavior and completely changed their perception of how it's useful. Right? So to innovate, is bringing an idea to market in a certain shape or form, making it valuable to you or seem valuable to you. It's really speaking your language as a consumer, showing you how this can make your life better. And we do that through creating value propositions. Right? So we're proposing that this is of great value to you because this will satisfy a want that you might not even have known that you had. But I'm presenting this good to you and this service and by using it, you can using it, use it in all these different ways, right? And that will make your life so much better off. There's a reason there are like beautiful people in commercials. Because people want, because it, they transmit sort of a feeling so that you get, you get the picture much more, much sooner than you would if you only had ugly people in commercials, <laughs> right? So it, it has more value to you can see the value more clearly. It's not about tricking you. It's really about informing you what is possible, right? So this little cream here will make me look like whoever is beautiful nowadays. But, <laughs> right? And, and by, by selling it like that, you get a feeling, oh, I should try that because I want to be beautiful too, right? I think Dr. Klein mentioned Clooney as the sort of the peak beauty or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's, that's his problem. Okay. <laughs> All right, so how does this happen then? How do, we, how do we deal with innovations? Well, to draw from Schumpeter again, and I do realize that this is the Mises Institute and Schumpeter is sort of mm, Austrian, <laughs> right? But he was a schooled Austrian and his earlier works are definitely more Austrian than his later works. So this is one of the first works, um, The Theory of, of Economic Development from 1911 or 12. So he was still sort of Austrian, and then he viewed the entrepreneur as sort of a heroic figure, a pioneer, um, almost like a semi-god or something, stepping into the economy and just shaking things up by creating value. Well, he, he identified that there are five ways you can do this and, and completely 
disrupt the economy. And one is to create new goods for consumers. That's sort of an obvious one, right? We can, we can think of many examples of this. Another way is a, a new method of production. So producing things in a very different way will facilitate different types of products and make more products available to you and probably make them cheaper as well. Create new markets, which is breaking new ground from the point of view of the, of the company. Could be taking an innovation from one industry, putting it in the next and disrupting that industry. A new source of supply, finding a new oil well or maybe finding a new way of take, getting oil out of rock or whatever. And my favorite and the most overlooked, new organizations new types, types of organizing production in an industry or in a firm or whatever, right? So very often what businesses do when they create new business models and new, new ways of producing is simply organizing people and resources in a different manner. So it's, it's a super important um, way of disrupting the economy. All right, so Schumpeter referred to these as new combinations, all of these. So you just create a new combinations. Again, it sounds like playing with Lego. And that's not really what we're doing here. These new combinations could be completely new types of, of machines, new types of factories, new types of logistics, like Amazon, for instance, things like that. Those are new combinations of resources. So it is creation, even though it looks like it's sort of simple. But it's, it's not really. Okay, so these new combinations, they facilitate in different ways new consumer value. So it creates a means to satisfy ends and wants in a better way or uh, to satisfy wants that were not satisfied before. Well, that is value, right? Even Menger talks about how value is the satisfying of a want that you had, right? That's, that's why value comes out of consumption. And the means of production are value, valuable because we're expected to contribute to this consumption, right? So what we have then is when we're talking about um, interest rates, uh, like I think Dr. Rittenauer talked about yesterday, and how interest rates shape investments in production and so forth, well, the, the savings rate, which determines the interest rate, really determines the rate of innovations undertaken. It doesn't mean that lower interest rate means that we get better innovations. We could just get more innovations. So more innovations um, will appear profitable to entrepreneurs, and they will go ahead with it if the interest rate is lower. Okay? But of course, they will go for the, the biggest, most valuable one first, because that's, that's the one that gives them greater profit, which is exactly what the promoter does, right? It's going for the profits. Okay, so what entrepreneurship does is they exercise a kind of judgment, and I think Dr. Klein mentioned this in his lecture too, in dedicating resources, trying to figure out how can we use all these resources, maybe taking a few extra steps and, and building new types of machines or new types of, of companies or new types of perceptions of goods or whatever it is. Uh, to create greater satisfaction. Well, they use imagination of what is possible that has not been done yet, and they use empathy. So they're basically placing themselves in the, in the shoes of consumers and putting themselves in their position, saying, well, this would probably be a good thing to produce because it will make people's lives so much easier. Right? Many, uh, many uh, very successful disruptive goods are produced in this way, right? that they're new, but they're intended to, and they're focused on making people's lives better one way or the other, okay? And by doing this, they direct factors, right? And we already talked about this. Um, by directing factors towards more highly valued ends, they're really increasing the value of those factors, right? So we know that factors are, are valued because of their contribution to satisfaction, ultimately, through consumption, which means if you take resources used over here for, towards that end, and you direct them to a new end over here that you perceive is going to be much more valuable, then the value of the factors increase too, right? And the difference in the shifting is basically your profit. Okay, so 
let's get to the Hayekian triangle. Because it's in the capital structure that we find the, the promoter, the entrepreneur, shifting things back and forth and completely changing the shape. And the one on the right is the one where we see, we talked about this a number of times before this week, where the interest rate falls because people save more and that decreases consumer spending and then we get more investment and that it sort of extends the, the triangle, it makes it longer but shorter. Okay, well how exactly does this work? How do we in, insert an entrepreneur here to make this happen? Well, the problem is right there. Right, there's one way thinking of, okay, well we'll just push it down and we'll drag it out a little bit. Well, it has a problem here that at least physically speaking or in terms of entrepreneurship that is hardly ever mentioned. And it is how we get to that point. Well, so if we illustrate this very, very simply, then, well, we can have Crusoe just catching fish with his hands. Or he can think, well, maybe I can produce a net and I can get more fish out of this. Well, producing a net needs to be inserted in the production process somehow, right? So if we take a more advanced production process, the production of automobiles. Say we have production of automobiles like this, where automobiles are made out of iron. So they all rust very quickly. So while we have the original factor, land, then we have different stages of production. So we have mining for iron ore, we have smelting of the, of the ore to get iron out of it, then we start producing automobiles out of that, and then we have dealerships who make the automobiles available for consumers, and then the consumer goes, yay, I can drive. That's the value, right? Okay, well, what if we would insert a promoter here saying that, you know, there's a better way of doing this. So we can produce automobiles using steel. It's much harder, it's not as soft. Um, it can protect from rusts much more easily, right? How do we do this? Well, it's not the case that we can just extend this. We have to insert it, right? It has to be there. Why? Because the production process is already complete, right? We go from original factor land to the lowest stage good, the automobile in the hands of the consumer. We can't add anything before land. There's no pre-land that we can add to it, right? So we have to insert new stages within the production structure, right? So when we extend the triangle, that's very macro in a sense, right? It's very abstract. But what's actually happening is that someone needs to figure out a new way of either replacing a stage that we're already using or inserting a new stage that makes the rest of the process much more valuable. And that's a much harder problem than just, oh, extend the triangle, right? Okay, so if you look at this then, this is the triangle again. The difference is that it's blue uh, and white. So if we innovate in this stage here, just take this out of the triangle. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this, but there are different stages, right? There are six stages in, in this triangle, uh, early and late stages, and then producing out, output uh, consumer goods at the right, right? So at the very left where the triangle begins, you have the original factors, land and labor, and then you're adding through, at one stage and then the next stage, you're adding value in a sense, you're getting closer and closer to the ultimate consumer good. Well, if we take that second stage there, so this is, we need to figure out a new way of doing this. That's the only way of changing this stage, right? So either we, we can insert one like we did with the steel, or we do it in a different way so we can increase the output, lower the cost, increase the quality or whatever it is, right? The value needs to increase or it doesn't make a difference. And as Dr. Herbener mentioned, this has to be a longer process, right? We're already using the shortest process we can think of and we're going for longer processes with more steps only if they are more valuable. If they produce more output, then, then we're gonna try it out. Right? So how do we do that? Well, basically we're splitting this stage into several different 
tasks or procedures or whatever it is. We might uh, develop new, new forms of capital, new machines, and, and, and what have you. Right? So we're taking this, which is one stage traded in the marketplace, and we're splitting it in a new way. So in a sense, we're creating a new sub-process. So we're replacing this one stage with a new type of, of production. Okay, well, these are new combinations, right? And this has to fit within the production structure. But since these are new, uh, a new process with new stages internally in this stage, the sub-process, what we're doing is really extending it this way, right? Because we have more operations, more tasks going on in this stage. So we're sort of extending that part of the triangle. This looks a little ugly. It's not much of a triangle anymore. Right? But the point is that this is actually really hard. Why? Because you can't just insert stuff uh, any way you like it. Rather, it has to fit in this process that already exists. Right? So what that means is that you have to be compatible. So even if you have a new sub-process, you have to use the inputs already used in the economy. Right? You have to buy the inputs from the first stage in this case and you have to sell the outputs used in the third stage. So even if you have a new process, it has to set, have the same interfaces, in a sense, as the previous stage that you're replacing. And at the same time, you have to create more value, because otherwise it's just, well, it's a failure. Right? So you have to use compatible inputs, and you have to produce compatible outputs, unless you're in the last stage and producing consumer goods, because then you can produce a completely different type of good, but you still have to use what is in the economy. No one, well, maybe someone, but that would be the stupid someone, would create a completely new process from original factors to consumption good in a specialized economy. Of course, you would use the resources that are already out there, but to the extent that you need new resources, you have to create them. And you probably need to educate people in this new way of doing things and so forth. Well, it's. There's another limitation, and I refer to that as incompleteness, that you have to cover the full distance, right? You have to start with the inputs of that stage, and you have to produce the outputs of that stage. And you have to cover the whole distance. You can't just stop halfway, because no one is going to buy whatever that is, half-finished something, because there's no market for that, right? So what we have is in this formalized example, you have a three-stage production process where you have three tasks, one, two, and three. And you have this entrepreneur thinking, hmm, I think there's a better way of, of producing whatever inputs are used in task three, using the outputs of task one. I just use a, a very different type of process that refines it and, and pushes more goods through and lower costs so I can make a profit out of it. And that is in itself a three-stage process. So I'll just call those tasks uh, 21, 22, and 23. And they're, they have to be uh, done in that order. right? So I'll insert those. Well, obviously, you can't insert those and then just skip 22, because that's going to leave a gap. right? You also cannot skip 21 or 23. So those are uh, interdependent. And they all have to be carried out in that order in order to make the production proceed. Right? Well, for those tasks, there are no market prices. You just invented the stuff. Right? So you have to start with pricelessness, because no one is bidding for those resources because you just made them up, basically. Right? So prices might come later when others are copying what you're doing and trying to beat you at what you're doing this new type of process, right? then they will probably try to bid for the people you have already trained, uh, buy the machines that you are using, and so forth. But in the beginning, when you are innovating, those new things that you create, they are priced, they're not priced by anyone. right? You can make something up like that, but that's not really a market price. But you need competition for that. Uh, so only later on will you have those prices, and then you can put it on the market, right? So you're, in a sense, producing this sub-process beyond the extent of the market because there are no prices that can guide you. So that's, that's how, I, how I define the firm and the role of the firm, the function of the firm in the economy. 
implementing this new innovation is necessarily integrated, right? It's necessarily somewhere else, and it relies on producing in pricelessness. So I elaborate on that in, in this book, uh, which is available downstairs. Uh, and online for those of you watching this stream. Um, anyway, so what, uh, what promoters are doing is creating this new stuff and they have to rely on their own judgment in doing this because there is nothing else. They cannot rely on prices other than for inputs and the outputs that they envision that they will be able to produce. Anything in between, that's up to them. Right? They have to figure that out somehow, okay? Now, another way of putting the, the triangle uh, is to use Rothbard's uh, diagram. And this one confuses the hell out of my students every year when I teach. Um, because apparently it's really hard to, um, to read. But we don't have to read it. Because we just have to see that there is a triangle in here. Right? That, that's all we need for now. And then, if we have in the second stage, you have a promoter innovating again, what is he doing? Well, he's really replacing that stage with a sub-process, right? Different ways of producing. So in this case, four uh, sub-stages. Obviously, what is, whatever is changing hands be between the first and the second sub-stages is not available in the market. There's no price, right? Because we just invented this stuff, okay? So entrepreneurship, we know, derives uh, drives change, it changes the capital structure, and we saw that it just did, right? The capital structure is very different. We've changed how things are, are done. We are, in a sense, beyond the extent of the market. Mar the market will follow, hopefully, if we're successful, but we're not there quite yet. Okay, so in production, any of these existing stages, an entrepreneur can enter and replace that stage with some other way of doing it. So there we have the great adjustments to production. We have how the promoter dissolves and reforms the capital structure. They create new capital and they accumulate more capital by creating new capital so that they can have this throughput of goods. Uh, and they, can, they increase the quantity of goods in the production process, thereby increasing our standard of living. Because that means more consumption goods at the end. right? So suddenly figuring, ah, steel. We can, do, we can produce steel, we don't have to use iron. Well, you make that happen, you accumulate capital and smelting plant and whatever else, else you need for a steel plant, and then you start creating steel, which increases the value of the output further down in the production process. Because a car made out of steel, well, if we're right, will be valued much more highly than a car made out of iron. Well, obviously, and the more easier to think about, I guess, example, is to change it, consumption and consumption goods. And as Austrians, we know that the lion's share of the economy is really in production, not in consumption. <clears throat> but we're always exposed to consumption goods. So it's easier to think about in terms of consumption goods. Well, these promoters, what they're doing is increasing the availability of already known goods, as in the steel example. They're, or you can have a new type of production that just increases out, outflow of goods, the production of goods, increases the quantity at, at lower cost. Um, we can facilitate new value by creating new uh, types of goods, and let's innovate, right? The, a new value proposition, a new type of business model. The iPad is, is, is the example I used a minute ago, right? And this drives social change too. Entrepreneurship changes the society overall and our culture and how we lead our lives. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. So, first of all, innovation doesn't have to be completely new. In fact, it's usually not. It's an improvement one way or the other. And as we said, innovation is the bringing to market of some idea, the implementation of it. So, this guy here innovates a round wheel, whereas the other guy with the square wheel is just complaining that this is not a new innovation. This is nothing new. I invented this square wheel already. You're just improving on what I made. Yeah, well, duh. But that's not the point, right? The square wheel would have pretty limited market value. The round wheel would have a lot of market value. It's the same, same invention, the wheel, 
right? But very different uh, usability, usefulness in the economy. Okay, so here you have creative destruction in changing how we behave. Uh, I mentioned the iPad already. The smartphone is one of those ways. We com consumers completely change how we behave and how we deal with things. So how many of you, just to raise your hands, are usually using one of those paper maps when you're when you're driving, driving somewhere, uh, opening it up. Most people will just use their smartphone, right? And it will, it will even tell you where to go. Like. But that changes your behavior, right? Suddenly you have internet in your pocket and then you, well, you can call people, but you could do that before, right? But you, you have all these possibilities and it completely changes how people act and behave and how people hang out. Right? When I was a, a teenager, no one has a cell phone. Instead, you had to, in advance, come up with a time and place where to meet. If the other guy did not show up, if your date did not show up, is it because she's late? Is it because that she just stood you up? Or is this, did something happen? You have no idea. You can't reach out either. Because the only way of reaching that person is to find a phone somewhere and then call their landline, right? Now, when we're, t when we're meeting up with someone, we just say, yeah, we'll, we'll meet in, in that city that day, and we'll just, we'll just text whenever. Very different type of behavior, right? It, it creates different consumptive uh, behaviors as well. So it, it changes how we behave as individuals and with each other, so completely new behaviors. It creates institutional change, and the obvious example nowadays is Uber versus taxi. So being a promoter doesn't mean you're just ch changing things, t tweaking things a little bit, but rather what Uber did was saying, wait a minute, we can basically provide a taxi service, just like a regular taxi service, but change it up a little bit, but sell it as com something completely different. So we can step outside of this regulated space where you have to pay taxes and you have to do things these ways that politician tells you, tells you uh, is a good way of running a taxi cab company, which is usually not the case. Um, and then Uber said, well, why, why don't we just skip that stuff and do it in a different way? Well, that freaked politicians out because they had to regulate this new space. They're like, oh my God, it's unregulated. We can't have people dri driving around and people traveling in cars. So it's completely new. What are we gonna do with this? But it also meant that it had to, ex it expanded our options. It made us realize that a regular taxi, what kind of madness is that? I don't know who's driving it. I don't know if it's a real one. I don't know if it's gonna show up. It's usually a terrible, ugly car in bad shape and it's overpriced. Now we know that oh, it's in my pocket. I'll just, oh, I'll just, I'll just get an Uber, right? That's not what happened before. Then you had to find a landline and call a taxi cab company and they would tell you whether you would get one or not and when, okay? So it changes what politicians have to react to this new reality when, when entrepreneurs change the way society works. Okay, it's also, it facilitates new types of transactions. And one is of course the sharing economy and everybody's sharing everything online. Um, I think you're all, you've all used uh, those things, sharing of underwear and I don't know what. Um, but that cuts out the middleman and, and, and it changes how we deal with things, right? But it's, it's not only through, it's not the technology. It's not the invention itself. It's not the technology in, in your smartphone that, that is the deal here. It's really that it facilitates new types of transaction. You can find other people and and you can pay them a, a small amount of money to live in their houses, in their house for a, a night or two. That that changes things because you couldn't find them before. You had no clue that they were actually offering their house. It's not the technology. The Sears catalog is an example of this. People were dependent on their local store. That was one local store. If you wanted something, you went to the store. If they didn't have it, you maybe you could ask them to order one for you, but those were the prices. That was it. The Sears catalog 
combined and, and put together producers and consumers in a different way. Suddenly you had millions of goods available that were not in the store. So they sidestepped the store and changed the, complete, changed the economic landscape, changed how people interact and how people transact. Okay? So we get new behaviors. And entrepreneurs have to deal with this. They have to create these new behaviors and make sure that we understand what those new behaviors are, that what the possibilities that we can get out of these goods that they're offering. They're not offering the, the thing itself. The thing is, doesn't, doesn't really matter. What matters is the whole experience. So how does this change our lives? That's the subjective valuation of the whole package. It's the, the price, it's the advertising, it's the service, it's whatever else they can make up that would be of value to consumers. That's what they're doing. They're changing people's behaviors. And how do you do that? Well, I used this slide in my previous presentation too. Because consumers don't know how they want to change their behavior. We don't know how we will react to a new type of good. And this non-quote by Henry Ford, had he actually asked people, what, are you, what is it you want? Let me, I'm, I'm like an innovator. What type of stuff do you want? Well, they would have said faster horses. Because they already had a carriage and they had a horse, but it was a lazy bastard, so <laughs> they want faster horses. Well, Henry Ford was like, that's, that's nuts. I'm not even going to ask them. It doesn't matter. Because I have this vision. I, have, I imagine that they would want a carriage without horses. Or even better, I'll put horsepower in a little engine. And then you can ride, run around with your little carriage without a horse. So he tried that. Right? That changed people's behavior quite a bit, you could say. And it changed the structure of the economy, too. Because you don't have as many stables today as you did before. You don't have to produce a whole lot of hay for cars. So it changed the whole economy with ripple effects just disrupting everything. And here's another guy, also that, that white guy, um, who says something to the same effect, right? That focus groups, we're not using focus groups in Apple because asking people about stuff they don't know anything about, they, they don't know anything about it. That's the whole point. So we'll just produce the good, and then when they see it, they go, wow, this is awesome. Which means, of course, that you can fail quite a bit. And, well, here we go. They have to offer, offer a, a feeling, offer the, a sense of the value that people get out of these products. Because people resist change. People don't want change. People want whatever they know already. New stuff is terrifying because it's uncertain. So very often you have to offer a good deal in order to enter the marketplace. And you have to start getting people to change their behaviors. And this has been the case all along. So this is a, a photograph from a previous protest where they protested this new technology that someone invented. Imagine if, if you would have had no entrepreneurs, or rather that you would have a democratic uh, economy. You have this entrepreneur saying, a wheel would be pretty cool. And you have people saying, nope. We already have feet, man. So, no wheel. Well, where would we be today? Obviously, we would be pretty much nowhere or wherever we were born because we couldn't get out of there other than walking. So they have to uh, challenge us and our behaviors. That's what entrepreneurs do. They have to overcome for us. They have to over overcome our resistance to the newness um, that they're offering. Okay, so they do this through changing the capital structure, like we saw before, both within production structures and by producing new types of goods. You need both. And by doing that, they are the driving force of the economy, just as Mises said, because right? they're changing not only the economy. The economy is just all this production that happens in order to give us the life that we, we choose and the life that we prefer. But they're directing capital and directing all our efforts as producers in order to bring about this new type of society. Right? So they are, in effect, directing 
the economy, hoping to make a profit. We're all as consumer sovereigns, so either we take it, yay, I'll pay for it, or we don't. And then they're out of business. That's their job. They're just directing whatever we might be able to get. So the, in conclusion then, you might be too, too young for the Jetsons, but the future seems wonderful. There are basically no limitations to what is possible in the future as long as we let entrepreneurs create our tomorrow, because that's what entrepreneurs are in the business of doing. They are disrupting the economy, they're changing production, and thereby creating whatever our lives are going to be like tomorrow, which I hear is going to be a life with masks. But <laughs> entrepreneurs tend to create something that is of greater value to us than something that we choose voluntarily. Right? So whenever you think of entrepreneurs and disruption, it's not really about destroy, destroying things, like Schumpeter had it, creative destruction. Right? That's, it's really about creating tomorrow, creating a better tomorrow. That's why, why we need these entrepreneurs, and that's why we need to let them figure out what works and let them fail. Unless they fail, we're never going to figure out what people actually want, what would actually benefit people. Okay, so I'll stop there. And here are links for those of you online uh, to my books in the store. Thank you very much. <laughs>